Welcome back everyone to Sequoia Park Zoo's conservation lecture series. Uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. I am Dr. Ruth Mock and I'm our Director of Conservation and Research at the Sequoia Park Zoo. And I chair the Zoo's Conservation Advisory Committee, which oversees the Zoo's conservation programs that were highlighted in our slideshow. We're really lucky to have Papa and Barkley sponsoring the lecture series again. They have supported the series for several years and have made the virtual series possible. So thank you very much to Papa and Barkley. Make sure we get out and support them in our community. And before the lecture starts, let me go over how to interact with us during the lecture. So first, as a disclaimer, I'm sure this popped up on your screen, but the lecture is being recorded and is streaming live on Facebook. So if your connection to Zoom is dropped, you can hop over to comment or watch on Facebook. And if you're having trouble connecting to Zoom, um, you might not be logged into your Zoom account. And we do require participants to be logged into one of your free Zoom accounts first before clicking on our link to join. And then at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a chat button. And you can ask questions to the speaker by clicking on the chat button and that will pop up a chat box where you can type your question. So if you're watching from a phone or a tablet, you may need to click on three dots at the bottom of the app, which will then give you the option to click on the word chat and that's where you can type your question or comment. So we'll try to answer everyone's questions at the end of the lecture. Feel free to submit them as you think of them as we're talking. Um, and we'll also monitor the Facebook Live comments and answer your questions from there as well. And during our in-person lectures, we always pass the hat around to collect donations for the Zoo's Conservation Fund so that our zoo can continue to support conservation work across the globe. So this year, we're virtually passing the hat by sharing a link to donate in the chat. And for those of you watching on Facebook, you can donate at our website at sequoiaparkzoo.net. So thanks everyone for prioritizing conservation. And joining us tonight is Dr. Michaela Gunther. She'll be introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Gunther is a professor in the Department of Wildlife at Cal Poly Humboldt, whose research focuses on the behavioral ecology of mammals. And she has served on Sequoia Park Zoo's conservation advisory committee since its inception in 2011 and she organizes this wonderful lecture series every year and we're so thankful for her efforts and passion for conservation and i will turn it over to michaela now thank you so much ruth for that lovely introduction and thank you all for coming this evening we recognize it's the end of a long day it's another zoom meeting so we're really grateful for the time you're willing to spend here with us. And as a member of the Sequoia Park Zoo Conservation Advisory Committee, and as a colleague of Dr. Ho Yi Wan's in the Department of Wildlife at Cal Poly Humboldt, I really am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Ho Yi Wan is the newest faculty member in our department, and he's the director of the Spatial Ecology and Conservation Science Lab. He has established a strong international presence through his research, leading multiple projects across four continents. His research aims to understand the drivers of change on natural resources at multiple spatial and temporal scales. Some of his current projects include development of multi-scale wildlife habitat and connectivity models, climate change scenario models, and human wildlife conflict models, some of which he'll be covering in tonight's presentation. Dr. Wan is also an advocate in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and his lab represents a microcosm of diversity and inclusion, has attracted students from an array of backgrounds, which we think brings innovation and creativity to our discipline of wildlife conservation. So let us feel connected when listening to tonight's talk by Dr. Ho Yi Wan, entitled, We Are All Connected, Understanding the Importance of Connectivity in Conservation and Management. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Ho Yi. Thank you for inviting me, uh, and thank you, Michaela, for the great introduction. Uh, now is the part that I must not mess up. Let me share my screen. Let's see, and I need to swap the presenter view. So I think it's working now. Looks great. Yep, we can see it. Okay. Uh, 
Yep, so tonight I'm going to be talking about connectivity, which is uh, one of my favorite subjects when it comes to conservation. So when we talk about connectivity these days, uh, one of the first thing that people usually think about is this, is uh, uh, internet and Wi-Fi connectivity, which it's actually good because uh, when I teach this in class, uh, it actually helps helps teach about wildlife connectivity and ecological connectivity to students. Uh, as as you all know, like connectivity is like really important in our life. Like we cannot live without it. Uh, even our lecture tonight uh, must require connectivity for us to to. Uh, have it, right? So it's so important. So I would tell my students, just like uh, internet or Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, uh, wildlife animals, they also need their connectivity. Now, when we talk about the internet connectivity, like usually uh, it comes through the wall and then through the cable to the modem and then we can get into our devices, right? Uh, and so the, we're physically connected to our devices sometimes to get the connectivity. But just like Wi-Fi, right? Sometimes we can also get connectivity without the physical connection. So what is connectivity? Uh, it, it's kind of like a abstract idea that we sort of understand, but it's kind of abstract. So uh, one definition that I kind of, came up with a simplified version of what connectivity is, is this. It is the degree to which something, like anything, like it can be, it can be matter, it can be organism, it can be uh, internet, right? Are joined or flows between spaces. Okay? Something that is joined or they flow between spaces. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, know what this game is on, on the slide. On the right hand side, so this go. Uh, so a ancient, like very ancient game, has a very long history uh, that or oriented from uh, Eastern Asia. So as you can see, like this game, like there are white pieces and black pieces, and the goal of this uh, game, like very briefly, like of course there are lots of rules, is you want to connect your pieces of your color, right? Either black or white, and you want to surround your opponent's pieces, right? So you want to disrupt their connectivity. Now, this might be uh, kind of hard if you don't know the rules of this game, but I'm sure the next one I show you, that most of you will understand and have experience with. So this is the connect four game, okay? So it's a very similar idea. Uh, those who have played with this game, like the End goal is that we want to have four pieces that are aligned and connected. Uh, so four pieces that are aligned or connected, either horizontally, vertically, or uh, diagonally. Right? If you achieve that, then you win. And if you play this game, you know that you're not just trying to connect your pieces. So while you're trying to connect your pieces at the same time, you have to try to disrupt your opponent, right? Try to disconnect them. Uh, so, so these are some of the games that we can try to understand what connectivity is, right? Not just from that definition, uh, but we can try to help us conceptualize what connectivity is. Now, how does this relate to ecological connectivity or connectivity that uh, uh, wildlife animals also require. So these are some of the ecological connectivity that we often study. Well, there are lots of things that's related to connectivity in ecology. And we can modify slightly the definition that I provided before to fit it under the framework of ecology. So ecological connectivity is the degree to which a landscape facilitates or impedes ecological flows. Okay. 
And there are lots of different ecological flows that uh, we can try to understand in nature. So for example, for organisms, a lot of us are interested in studying organisms, how they behave and what affects them. So for organisms, they move, right? Uh, but what actually moves? So it can be at, ver at the, a variety of levels. So from the molecular level, you can try to understand how genes move. So when species move, when they mate, they exchange genetic information. So the genes can actually move across the landscape, right? which can lead to genetic diversity, which is a very important subject in conservation these days. Uh, for individuals also, they move, so this is a rather easier uh, level to understand where you can see, right? Because we can actually visualize and we can see them on the landscape, see individuals moving and we can measure the flow, right? How they move. And then we can measure from the level of metapopulations, how the population are moving uh, on the landscape and form a network of populations. We call that metapopulation. And then we can also measure population. We can quantify population and then see how population might change over time. And then the whole species can also move, right? We call that range shift. Uh, so the whole range can actually move. So we can quantify those. Close. Now, not just organisms, uh, but a lot of other things also can flow. Uh, lots of materials, for example, like air, right, water, sediments, nutrients, and so forth. Like all these things, they can move and create flows, and we quantify them and see how connected they are. And there are other things, right? energy, which is important. Uh, we study energy from the sun to the earth, and how the, the plants can absorb the energy and leads to a lot of other things because they are consumed by other organisms, right? So we measure energy, energy flow, and it can also be kinetic energy, right? Because uh, water, for example, can store kinetic energy and we can measure those flows and then see how connected those flows are. Information, so this, uh, very interesting area of study actually. So information can also flow. Uh, for example, the parents can pass on important information to their offspring that can help promote their fitness. Right? So the information can also uh, flow and then we can measure how connected they are. Like how, do, how are those information being transferred? How do species communicate? Right? And what might disrupt their communication? So there are lots of things that are related to ecological connectivity. And when we talk about connectivity, uh, we can also classify them into structural connectivity versus functional connectivity. Now, structural connectivity is uh, simple. It's very easy to uh, quantify and measure compared to functional connectivity. For example, if you're measuring habitat, it is basically the physical connectedness of your habitat. So you can go out and you can measure them. And with satellite imagery, something that I do a lot uh, using remote, sen remote sensing data, you can easily visualize the structural connectivity of any focal uh, phenomenon that you're interested in such as habitat. And in this figure, the bottom left, for example, uh, from left to right, you have low connectivity, right? Two separate patches. And then the next one, you have some stepping stones in between them. So providing some connectivity through this stepping stone. And then slowly you have more and more connectivity, like you kind of see this bridge, but it's broken off in the middle. And finally you have this like, corridor or a bridge connecting two habitat patches. So structurally, you have low connectivity to high connectivity. But researchers are not just interested in studying structural connectivity. We're also interested in studying 
functional connectivity, which a lot of times are more important than just structural connectivity. So what is functional connectivity? It is an organism's response to the physical structure of the landscape. And then how that response facilitates or impedes its movement or ecological flow. Okay. Uh, so here, for example, like even though structurally, the figure at the bottom, left, uh, bottom right, so even though structurally it's broken up, right, this stepping stone, but functionally is still providing a pathway for species to move between the two bigger habitat. Right? So, so you can measure the functional connectivity by seeing whether they can actually move across. Uh, and vice versa, like even though sometimes you might have perfectly intact uh, connectedness between two different locations, but depending on some other mechanism, the species might not be able to move across. For example, maybe the species require uh, the right temperature in order to survive. And then if the area where it's connecting to location is too hot or too dry or for whatever, for whatever reason, they might not be able to move across, right? Creating some barrier that's not caused by the structural uh, connectedness, but causing by some other um, factors. And one thing to know is kind of like when we play the connect for game. Something that's providing connectivity to one thing might actually be disrupting connectivity for another thing. So take a look at this picture. I want you to just take a look and think. So usually this, if, if we're more interactive, because I can't hear you right now, uh, this is when I ask my question, uh, my student a question like, so what is providing connectivity here in this picture? Okay. So some of you might immediately notice, right? There's like this water here, right? That's providing maybe connectivity for uh, some aquatic species, right? And then also there's this road here, right? This road might be providing connectivity for humans. The humans uh, carry a lot of things. And there's also power lines. Do you see those power lines? So this, this power lines might be providing connectivity for electricity to flow. And then in the background, you have, uh, of course, like this terrain where terrestrial species can move. Now, for the terrestrial species then, their block, their connectivity is cut off by this water here. Right, so, so that's what I was talking about. So something that's providing connectivity for some organisms might be blocking or disrupting connectivity for other organisms. Uh, so when we talk about connectivity, we have to consider the context. So we need to think about what, what are the species that we're trying to understand and what kind of flows are we trying to quantify, measure, what kind of function are we actually uh, studying? So it's context dependent. So we cannot say, oh, this landscape has very high connectivity for the wildlife. You have to ask like, for what wildlife, right? And for what function, what, what are we talking about here? So it's context dependent. Uh, why is ecological connectivity important? So I uh, have a little video to show you here. Um, so I hope the sound is working and uh, the, the, the audio level might be a little higher than my voice here. So, so you might want to uh, lower the volume or make some adjustment. Okay, so I'm gonna play, hopefully it's gonna work. So this to help you understand the importance of connectivity for wildlife. Mass wildlife migrations is a natural phenomenon that occurs all around the world. In Africa, wildebeest undertake mass migrations as seasons change in search of food and water. These mass migrations are important for several reasons. For example, these animals are food for larger predatory mammals, such as lions. They're also hunted by humans and have been a source of food and clothing for millennia. Finally, 
These animals are important for tourism, as many people come to see animals in the wild. Unfortunately, wildlife populations are declining in many areas in Africa. One big problem is that protected areas, such as game reserves and national parks, are too small. Human settlements outside of these areas are expanding and blocking the migration pathways these animals use. In Kenya, the population has increased from 5.4 million people in 1948 to 47.6 million people in 2019, an increase of 780%. As the population has increased, so has the rate of habitat loss, as land is used for houses and farming, leading to the construction of fences and roads, which create barriers to migration. In the Maasai Mara ecosystem in southwestern Kenya, the privatization of land has resulted in fences spreading like wildfire. Wildlife is frequently trapped inside fences and many are killed while struggling to escape. Fences block wildlife migratory routes, accelerating the collapse of wildlife migration. Fences also exclude wildlife from their traditional habitats and watering points. In addition, uncontrolled sand harvesting on riverbeds makes it difficult for wildebeest herds to cross the rivers. Aside from the proliferation of fences, increasing settlements, agriculture, humans and livestock, and construction of roads have also contributed to the collapse of the Mara Luita wildebeest migration. The Mara Luita is the last ungulate mass migration in Kenya to collapse. A similar and more catastrophic collapse of wildlife migration occurred from 1999 to 2000 in the Athi Kaputiai ecosystem, which includes the Nairobi National Park, also found in Kenya. However, this situation can be improved. Removing and controlling the spread of fences would help make migration routes accessible again, along with expanding or increasing wildlife conservancies. Roads, railways and oil and gas pipelines should be routed away from migratory pathways. Where this is not possible, wildlife migrations could be helped by building underpasses or overpasses, where roads and other barriers cross migration routes. To initiate these projects, sustainable incentives need to be given to the local people, which would replace the earnings lost from removing the fences. Moving forward, support from the national and county governments is essential to prioritise and accelerate the development and implementation of county spatial plans and ecosystem management plans. This support, in addition to that of local communities, will be essential in safeguarding migration routes and ensuring the future of wildlife populations in Kenya. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I love the animations. It's really, I wish I am an animator. So I can just create a bunch of these videos that I don't have to personally teach a lecture. I can just show it to my students. Uh, but it's really cool, right? Like, as you can see, like, connectivity is very important. In the animation that I just showed, the migration route, right? That is also a connectivity problem. They're building roads, fences, right? The, to block those migration routes, cut off the connectivity. Um, and I'm gonna show some more local example later on this, uh, in our country. But so quick summary, why is ecologi uh, ecological connectivity important? Right. So wildlife animal, they need the connectivity to gain access to important resources such as water, food, right? uh, they also need to have access to find a mate uh, so they can produce, produce offspring right? and pass on those genetic information to future generations. They also need connectivity for migration, kind of like what we just talked about uh, in the previous animation. And this is gonna be more and more important because as climate is changing, uh, a lot of the habitat is being altered. So are the species gonna be able to adapt? Will largely depend upon how well they can migrate to a suitable habitat in the future. So connectivity is gonna be more and more important. Uh, so at the university, something that I uh, teach a student is how to quantify connectivity. 
this is so important, we actually need to quantify them, right? So that we can uh, better plan ahead to see what we can do for the precious wildlife species. So if we're talking about structural connectivity, then it's actually uh, a little easier, kind of, uh, simple. There are some connectivity metrics that we can use to quantify structural connectivity. And there's a software called FRESH that can easily help us using uh, GIS layers to conduct this calculation. So there are two most commonly used connectivity metrics called patch cohesion index and connectance index. And this is an example. So this is in Zimbabwe. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see all those green dots, green patches. Uh, so those are the vegetated areas, which is most important for the wildlife animals. And for this study, uh, COVID et al. 2021, they try to measure the structural connectivity of these uh, vegetated areas. And you can see like this heat map is the patch cohesion index. So the warmer color represent higher connectivity of those vegetated areas. And the greener area represent lower uh, patch cohesion, so lower connectivity. And they also found that the connectivity is related to the temperature, uh, land surface temperature. So uh, because if it's really hot, 48 degrees Celsius is really, really hot. Uh, so if it's hot, then it's related to other things, right? Usually uh, less plants can survive there. And then if it's cooler, then usually more plants can survive there. So, uh, so temperature is an important limiting factor of this uh, structural connectivity of, of the vegetated areas. So with climate change, when things get hotter and hotter, the connectivity is going to reduce. And this structural connectivity that we're talking about. How about functional connectivity? Uh, so usually I will uh, teach my student about functional connectivity by asking them to move from one end of the classroom to the other end of the classroom. Now, most of the students, when they do this, they're going to move from, let's say, from this door to this door, right? They're going to find the fourth door and then they go to the other side like that, right? But like almost, almost every semester, like uh, there's going to be like that one or two students, they, they, they would do something crazy, right? They, they, they might like to jump on the table or whatever, or they go around and then go get to the other side. So the point here is depending on the individual or the species that you're studying, their behavior is going to be different. And the things that affect their connectivity is going to be different, right? kind of similar to what we have been talking about. It's going to be context dependent. So, so these are some of the common ways to quantify functional connectivity. Uh, so I'm just listen, listing them here. I'm not going to go too deeply into the methods because of time. <laughs> this usually takes uh, many lectures to cover each of these topics, right? To uh, talk about the method, but I'm going to briefly talk about each of them. So we have graph theory, least cost, factorial least cost analysis, circuit theory, and resistant kernel. And so these are uh, the most common methods that uh, ecologists use to quantify functional connectivity. So graph theory is uh, the simplest model. So we there are some dots we call nodes, and then there the lines connecting the dots we call these edges. Uh, so the, the nodes can represent the core habitat, and then the lines between them can represent corridors, for example. Right? And then we can create a graph that looks like this to depict the general area that's important for the species. Uh, and it can be movement. It doesn't have to be movement, though. It can be other type of flows that's important for species. Uh, so, so this is pretty cool and uh, pretty easy and pretty simple. Uh, so this uh, an example. So for example, here, if, this, if it is a forest species, and you see these forest patches, you can put some notes there representing like some core forest 
habitat. And then you just connect them using some sort of threshold. You can try to depict and delineate this, uh, this edges or these lines connecting the dots. Where areas that have no forest, then you don't connect them, right? So this is a pretty simple uh, way to depict connectivity. The more lines and more dots uh, represent more connectivity or higher connectivity. So the advantage of this is, is simple, it's easy, but the disadvantage is also is simple and it's too easy, right? It, it doesn't tell you a whole lot. So other people have developed methods that can help us understand more sophisticated uh, connectivity patterns. So for example, least cost analysis. So what is least cost analysis? So for example, uh, same landscape, we can, rasterize the landscape and pixelate it basically. And for each pixel, we can give it a value representing something we call resistance. So resistance is uh, something that's blocking the movement or blocking the connectivity. Uh, so if it has a low resistance, then the species or the flow can move through them easily. But if it, if it has a high resistance, for example, the roads here, then things cannot move across them so easily. Right? Pretty uh, intuitive. And then when you have this on a map, right? You have all the values then you can connect the two location of interest with the least resistance. Okay, so for example, this path here represents the least cost or least resistance. Uh, but, a lot of times species, they, jo they don't just use a single route or single path, right? Uh, so people have developed factorial least cost analysis connecting multiple uh, paths of least cost. So kind of like a network of least cost paths. So, so to help us better understand right, the entire network of connectivity instead of just one path. Uh, however, this is still for a lot of species, it might not be uh, biologically meaningful because you know some species they're more mobile. They don't rely on paths, so they can move, you know, anywhere. Like for example, bird, right? They can move across broad spaces. So then there are other methods developed. So one of them is called circuit theory uh, or circuit scape. It's a software that you can use to create a current map. So, so kind of like the same idea of resistance, but you flip it, you know, it's a conductance uh, service. You try to see where uh, movement is most likely to occur is a probability looking at all the paths across the landscape. Uh, so this is kind of like a heat map. Uh, we call this a current map. So higher current represents higher connectivity and it stems from uh, electrical engineering, right? Same from circuit theory in electrical engineering. Um, but this is still assuming that species have a, a, an origin and then they have a predestination that they're trying to move to. But sometimes species move uh, randomly. They, they, they don't really have a destination. So there's another method called resistant kernel analysis. So this is just to consider what's the dispersal ability of a species and also consider the density of uh, the species population. And this is just a single individual on the landscape, for example, on panel A here on the left-hand side. So this is the dispersal ability of the species. If, you know, it has a boundary, right? how far they can disperse. And then the color represents how likely they're, they're gonna be moving in those areas. Because even though they can travel that far, but doesn't mean that they will travel that far, right? And when you combine a lot of Kernels, right? this is a single kernel, you can buy a lot of kernels representing the entire population estimate of the area. You get a map that looks like this on the right, which we call cumulative persistent kernel service. A really cool heat map showing the connectivity. Right? The warmer color represents higher connectivity, and the cooler color represents low connectivity or barrier in this case. So you can see there's a physical barrier that, that disrupts the connectivity. What, what are the applications? What are some applications? 
Uh, so I want to show you uh, the New Mexico Wildlife Habitat Linkage Assessment that, uh, that I did. So, so there are actually a lot of species that we uh, that, that I and my collaborators uh, study. And I'm just going to be showing you like five of them here. We have the elk, the pronghorn, bighorn sheep, black bear, and lesser prairie chicken. Uh, so for example, uh, there, so the New Mexico game and fish there, they're, they're interested in studying the connectivity of all these species. And they have some publishing estimates, right? So these are what they call the GMU or game management unit. So it looks like very blocky. Uh, so they have some publishing estimates. They want to know like, oh, what, what is the connectivity across uh, the state of New Mexico here for the elk, for example, here. Uh, so I converted those population estimates into density surveys, and, and ultimately I want to get a more natural looking uh, distribution of the elk here, right? So from A to D, you can see like from a very blocky to D, right? You have the, the points scattered across the state, some area with higher density, some area with lower density. And with the density estimates, we can combine it with what we call the landscape resistance surface. So a landscape resistance surface is similar to what I talk about when we talk about the least cost path analysis. So if there are areas with high resistance uh, as shown here with uh, darker color, right? So the roads, for example, the city or the desert, right? So those are area with high resistance because the species is unlikely to uh, move across those areas or, or or they present challenges for the species to move across. And then lighter color here is low resistance. So they're more likely to move across those areas. So then I can conduct connectivity analysis. We look at the corridors, we look at the uh, local area that they're using for movement. Right? So, so there are lots of different connectivity maps I can uh, create and calculate based on the resistance surface and where they're at. And then I also can prioritize those areas to see like which area deserve more conservation attention or management efforts. So here I'm ranking them by the connectivity strength of the key habitat area and then the corridors. Um, and, and that is what the game and fish people want, right? They want to see where the connectivity is highest. But for conservation scientists, some, sometimes we also want to look at where connectivity is lower so that we rank those higher actually. So it's kind of like a reverse uh, ranking because you might want to promote connectivity in those areas. Right? So how you rank them uh, vary. It depends on your management objective, depends on the research question. But these connectivity maps are useful. And the resistance surface uh, is going to be different for each species because they have different movement patterns, different dispersal ability, different preferences, different behavior. So the resistance surface are going to be different. And as a result, right, the corridors are going to be different. The key habitat is going to be different. And the prioritization is going to look different. They're all going to look different. And those results, those results along with uh, results for other species are included in the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. Uh, we have a draft right now. Currently, it is, uh, we, we have the public commenting period right now. So this is out for people to read and to comment on it. Uh, and it's part of the Wildlife Corridors Act signed by uh, the governor, governor in New Mexico back in 2019. And it is one of the first, well, I think it's the first uh, Corridors Act uh, across the country. Uh, and it directs the Department of Transportation and Department of Game and, Game and Fish there to develop this Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. And uh, a lot of the results that I produce are included in this plan. Uh, for example, so I was showing you the connectivity of the different species, and uh, we also overlay 
the major roads on top of it. So this is the predicted connectivity of six focal species of concern. Uh, and with the intersection of the connectivity areas, with major roads in New Mexico. And, and then we can see like which section of the roads might be uh, providing more connectivity. And that's, you know, it might also have greater collision risk uh, and also can identify areas for us to promote connectivity uh, to facilitate movement, for example, across highways. And this is a map for all six species. Um, and so I rank them, right? So, so, so we rank these uh, highways by different section to show like which section is providing uh, the highest connectivity for different species. So the different color represent different species here. Uh, and, and these are the top priority section of the highway that require attention. And so after knowing that, what can we do? Right, so some of the things that have already been done there is you know, they're building this uh, mid bridges to facilitate movement. In this case, we know that this location have uh, lots of mule deers. So we also put camera there to try to see if they work, if, if it's working or not. Right, so this is one thing that we can do. We also put fence to kind of funnel the species toward this uh, crossing here. Uh, we also have this box cover to facilitate movement. So for this kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, we have evidence showing that the bears and uh, bobcats are using them, which is uh, pretty interesting. And also, for example, uh, for this location, we identify it as high connectivity for the mule deer, and there was a gate that was set by the landowner there. And uh, so we told the landowner, well, this is uh, an area of high connectivity for the mule deer, like, could you remove it? And the landowner did. And now it's providing connectivity for the mule deers. And this is also really uh, cool. So on the right, we have the old type of culvert. It's kind of like a mini tunnel here, but this, Kind of small, and we know that this location like have a lot of uh, is potentially important for uh, animals like mule deer and, and, and elk, and and they don't really move across this like small covert. Well, at least not in a big herd, right? So we expanded it and built this box covert to facilitate uh, greater movement and connectivity. So those are some examples uh, of how we can use it. And not only it can help us to protect and conserve connectivity for wildlife, it actually also help uh, humans. It safeguard human lives and property because we can identify where are the locations with high connectivity, then that also lead to higher collision probability, right? Vehicle collision probability. So in those areas, like we, in, uh, is part of our recommendation in the wildlife corridors action plan. We suggest you know, these uh, signs or message board be uh, set up in those locations to reduce vehicle collision. So there are lots of uh, cool things that we can do. Uh, because of time, there are actually a lot of other applications that's related to connectivity. So I'm just gonna briefly show you uh, some of these applications, not gonna uh, discuss too deeply. Another thing that we can use that I've done in the past is to look at urban green space. So in a lot of cities, like urban green space is becoming more and more uh, important. We know that this is important, uh, not only for wildlife animals, but also for human. It actually can promote human health, have a lot of uh, health benefit to do when we have more green space in urban area. Uh, so this study was conducted in China, in Luohe, China. Uh, so the research question was to see whether there's enough 
green spaces to provide the logical connectivity uh, in the city? And where are the locations where we might need to build more, uh, maintain or establish more green spaces? Uh, so using similar methods I talked about, right? This is the connectivity map. Uh, the warmer color represent greater connectivity of those green spaces. Uh, and the blue location, for example, like this area, let me see if I can use the annotate tool, like this location, this location. So these are arg agricultural area. So those are the areas that is blocking most of the connectivity. So this is the, uh, I like the summary of this study. And of course, there's also recommendation on how we can promote more connectivity. For example, uh, our recommendation is to try to promote the connectivity between these two locations here. You see this gap here. So if we can build have like a triangle, like a triangle of connectivity, then that will be uh, very good. Uh, and then finally, genetic connectivity is also important. Uh, I briefly mentioned in conservation, this is becoming more and more important. How can we promote genetic diversity? And one of uh, the things that we can do is to promote genetic connectivity because if you have more genetic connectivity, there's more gene flow that will lead to greater genetic diversity. And this study uh, we conducted in Europe in the Mediterranean Sea to look at this endangered coral species. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but like this pie chart represents the uh, different genotype. You can think of it as have different types of uh, population, or or they contain different genes. Okay, we want to see like whether those genes can flow freely among all these different uh, coral colonies. And this is the connectivity map. The green line shows that there's a very uh, low resistance. And then the red line shows that there's a high resistance of their genetic exchange. So, so the genetic material is not going to be so easily uh, moved across those areas. And, and these, these species, they only, because they're coral, so they don't actually move. Uh, uh, so we're trying to see. Uh, whether um, the, the the offspring you know, when they're in larvae stage, you know, how they move. So they usually move uh, along the shore. So finally, this is the concluding slide. Uh, I, I picked this picture because it's, right, first of all, it's adorable. It's really cute. Uh, two authors here holding hands. And the holding hands represent connectedness, right? And con connectivity. So, uh, and the take home message of my talk tonight, first is hopefully you understand the connectivity is important to uh, the wildlife, okay? It's very important. And then the next thing is uh, we can help conserve connectivity. There are lots of things that humans can do to help conserve connectivity. And if we continue to work on this, you know, study connectivity for species and try to identify solution to help conserve and promote them. A lot of species, including the listed endangered threatened species can actually be safe. And thank you very much. Uh, that is my talk for tonight. If you want to ask me more questions, uh, these are my content information, my email. Uh, if you want to see the papers that and like those publications, you can find them on my website here. And then uh, I, I also have a Twitter account, but I, I don't really use it that much, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Wan. Uh, we are eager to jump in with questions and I'll share questions from our Zoom chat and from the Facebook live comments and we'll keep checking to see if new questions are submitted. Um, so feel free to send them in now. And as a reminder too, our lecture series is possible thanks to the sponsorship of Papa and Barkley. And our other conservations would not be possible without your help. So we will paste the link to donate to the conservation fund again in the chat too. Um, 
I just want to start by saying I'm so excited and blown away by the Wildlife Corridor Act that you were participating in getting made possible in New Mexico. Um, so congratulations, that's an amazing accomplishment. And I'm really curious what, how you're gonna use those skills here in Humboldt now that you're, now that we've secured you over here at, <laughs> um, at Cal Poly Humboldt. How are you going to do research locally now on connectivity? Yeah, uh, so I, I would love to do more research uh, locally in Humboldt or in California uh, that's related to connectivity. And I have been in touch with different agency, you know, I have talked with them, but uh, we're always limited by funding, of course, right? So uh, we also need to hopefully come up with some funding to do research kind of like what I did in uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, I've talked with different agency folks and they're all very interested and uh, they show support. Uh, but the limiting factor here is funding. So if we have funding, then we can uh, get students uh, to learn all those techniques that I was showing and then they can do marvelous, fantastic work. Uh, and I think that will help improve uh, the productivity for wildlife here in Humboldt and maybe California. Yeah. Wonderful. We have a question asking if um, you can elaborate a bit on what we can do to help with conservation of connectivity, maybe just on our own properties. Are there, are there ways that people can, just as regular citizens can get involved? I, I know that you mentioned just even removing that gate was really helpful for passage of the mule deer. Um, so what are some what are some things our listeners might be able to do? Yeah, uh, so I think for me personally, like my property is not going to help much because I have a very small house. But I know there might be some landowners who uh, have lots of land. Uh, so, so, so that might be something to look at if, if you're a, a private landowner that own lots of land. Like, so, so there are lots of things that can affect connectivity, not just fences, not just gate. Right? It can also be a uh, power line. It can be just cutting down trees sometimes. And the way that you cut down trees also matters. Uh, it can be agricultural. Uh, so a lot of things. So really depends on the type of land that you have, the spatial configuration uh, of the landscape, and what, what species might be of concern in that area. Uh, one species, for example, that I study for many years is a spotted owl, um, so which is a very, very interesting species to study because they, a lot of them live in forests, like old growth forests. Uh, if, if we don't, do anything with the forest now, like a lot of them are really dense, which is prone to fire, for example. So if the fire burns through them, that actually might affect their connectivity. If it's like, like mega fire, like across like really large space, right? That can disrupt the ability for them to fly uh, to other location and affect their uh, dispersal patterns. So, so something that I know lots of land management agencies are trying to do is to thin the forest. Uh, but then thinning the forest is also tricky because when you cut down trees, it reduces fire risk, but at the same time, it might actually reduce habitat quality for species that's using those trees and forests. So how to maintain the balance? So, so that's my expertise actually. So I've, I've done a lot of uh, studies to, to model right, how the different treatment scenarios might affect uh, both fire risk and also the connectivity and habitat quality. So try to achieve a balance there. So that is a part that's uh, a little tricky, uh, but, but yeah, there are methods uh, to, to try to help us uh, answer those questions. So, so, so two of my students, by the way, are kind of studying that question right now, studying the smaller owl. Uh, and we're also gonna project it forward to see how climate change might their role. So it's highly complex. Uh, the things that I was showing is, of course, a, a simplified version of a lot of things. 
But in reality, it's like cognitively, it's very, very complex, but we do have the tools and the methods to better understand them. I, th I think that those examples you showed of those six species illustrated that very well, how complicated and specialized it is for each species that we're trying to think about. Um, yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so that was a really great illustration. Um, another question is, was it difficult to put in the wildlife corridors in New Mexico or were there plenty of established underpasses and it was just a matter of directing the animals to those underpasses? Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of uh, underpasses and not just underpasses, right? Like overpasses, you know, all sort of things that uh, we've already tried to do in the past, uh, even before the uh, wildlife uh, corridor estuarine plan was drafted. So part of the recommendation is also to uh, verify the effectiveness of those underpasses, overpasses, right? Those wildlife crossing. Uh, so the models that I built help answer that. You know, like, is it effective? Are those locations ideal? Uh, should we maybe use some of the resources to maintain those crossing to other location, right? Or, or the ones that are really effective, should we expand them? So those are the type of questions that managers uh, are you know, most concerned about. Uh, and, and we work together you know, to, to see how our models can better inform those decisions. And we have a question about what types of people do research on connectivity? Uh, so, so, I might be biased, but I would say like people who really love the environment and wildlife. Uh, so, so we are the people that want to do connectivity. So that is that is a must. If you <laughs> if you're in this business, you must love wildlife. I think kind of like everyone here. If you're in this talk, you must love wildlife. Uh, then secondly, uh, people with really good quantitative skills. I would say because a lot of this. Models are quite complex, requires lots of skills, uh, interdisciplinary skills, actually. So you need to know about wildlife, you need to know about statistics, you need to know about spatial ecology, you need to know about GIS, remote sensing, computer simulation. Uh, yeah, so, so quantitatively, uh, they kind of need to be, be up there in order to do this analysis. And it sounds like your lab is focusing on that type of research. And so that might be a good resource. Um, I assume you have on your website some information about your lab and how people might apply to work in that lab too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, of course, if you're a student or if you uh, have a desire to maybe get like a graduate degree or something, uh, talk to me, definitely talk to me. We have some Facebook comments saying, awesome lecture, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, we had a le the lecture last month talked, it was a completely different topic, but one of the examples was about connectivity and reestablishing a new migratory path for elephants that to evade a zone where there was heavy poaching. So they were disrupting the traditional migration route using some of these techniques you were talking about different barriers um, to redirect the elephants and it reduced the poaching to zero just by this this new migration route they were able to develop um, so it's a cool connection from our last talk to your talk when we were when you were sharing that video it it made me think of that lecture um, by Ken Ramirez as well. But yeah, con connectivity is critical to conservation planning and, and thinking about how we can serve wildlife. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and there's some, uh, I received some direct messages from people, should, should I try to address them or? Um, sure, yeah, if there's anything we haven't covered yet, go for it. Uh, yeah, so I have a question about the use standing connectivity in any species native. Oh, okay, I think I have answered that question. Uh, 
Just curious, when certain corridors get built, such as box covers, what agencies are responsible for maintaining them and making sure they stay clear for wildlife? Uh, so I guess it varies by the state, but for example, in New Mexico, it was the Department of Transportation and Department of Game and Fish. Uh, it also depends on where those are located, like the, the land ownership might also matter, right? Because sometimes they're also covered uh, in, let's say, like BLM land or U.S. Forest Service land, right? Uh, then, of course, I think those will be maintained by whichever agencies have the ju jurisdiction. Um, hope that have answered your question. Uh, like you said, very interdisciplinary work. So it's also very yeah. interagency work. Yeah. We also have another um, question from Facebook that was, I loved seeing the work in New Mexico and the example from China. I recall learning about the design of reserves in Costa Rica in the early 2000s about creating corridors that go from the sea to the mountains. How common are these setups today? And then she kind of has a follow up question of how did the New Mexico law come to be? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so two parts of the question. So corridors, yes. Uh, in fact, we are doing those in California. I know there are corridors uh, built for, for example, the, the cougars in Southern California. Uh, so so it's, it's definitely growing, I would say, uh, in a lot of places. You know, people recognize that it's not just maintaining habitat, but the the linkage between the habitat is also important. So, so more and more places are, are doing that, creating corridors. And one thing further is uh, assisted migration and augmented gene flow, which is also related to connectivity. So, it, so not just connecting what habitat we have right now, but also anticipating the future, trying to see what climate change might influence our landscape. Then you start building those corridors to connect to ideal locations that species can migrate into in the future. So that's an area that's uh, kind of conservation biologists are focusing on and augmented gene flow, which is a little bit more controversial uh, depending on, I guess, your location, people might or might not support it because uh, some people might think that, oh, you're messing around with uh, evolution or something. Uh, but to me, I, I feel like it's, uh, totally warranted to start thinking about augmented gene flow, which just means, you know, what kind of genotypes might be more uh, or well adapted to future climate. And you start to plan ahead and preserve those genetic diversity and move them to location where they can facilitate reproduction so that those traits can pass on to future generations. So, so that is also uh, kind of, newer area that is still a little controversial now, but, but I personally, I feel like, yeah, we, we kind of have to do that, uh, given that climate change has such a huge influence. And I forgot the second part of the question. Could you <laughs> no, <that's fine>. yeah. <laughs> remind me? Uh, yeah, I should have waited to ask it, but how did the New Mexico law come to be? The wildlife I, I don't know, like maybe maybe a miracle, maybe like <laughs> conservation scientists and wildlife lovers prayed very hard or something. Well, actually, there there was a petition uh, before that happened. Uh, so so they talked with the uh, uh, legislatures and they talked with policymakers, showing them the science behind it, right? Showing them the importance of maintaining connectivity. And if you happen to have you know, legislatures and policymakers who are like, who back science and who believe in data-driven policy, right? Then something good might happen. Uh, I know in some states it might be more difficult. Yeah, shouldn't be a problem here though. Certainly, we we have the precedent of that, like you mentioned, that large corridor that is being built, yeah. um, the Santa Monica Mountain area. Um, so that that's a good precedent that hopefully we can work on this more as well. Um, and we have some more comments as well and extremely appreciated the lecture. Thank you. And uh, Gretchen Ziegler asks, seems like Caltrans loves to erect more and more barriers 
for driver safety along the 101. But what is your opinion about these new barriers if you have one for wildlife and how do you think citizens can influence this? Yeah, so that, you know, it's always hard, right? These are human dimension, right? Sometimes you have human wildlife conflicts. Um, uh, yeah, whenever it, it, it has to deal with like social aspect of things and, and humans, human lives, right? Human properties, then it makes it very difficult to balance the need uh, between animals versus human. Um, so we, we definitely cannot neglect the importance of protecting uh, our safety. I think that is very important. Uh, that said, I also feel like there is common ground for us to maintain both. And that's part of the reason why we're doing these models for New Mexico, right? We're trying to identify areas with really high risk of uh, vehicle collision so that the approach that you do, like for example, the type of barriers that you build uh, and the type of underpasses or overpasses, the location of them, uh, you, can, you can have better information to know how to do them with these models that I show you. So even with 101, I think there's opportunities to better study where my collision uh, occur more often, more, most frequently, and then what type of animals might be killed by those collision, right? So then, then we can come up with a game plan to see, oh, so maybe we can divert the animal to move over there, right? Uh, I showed you briefly, right? We build fences to to kind mm -hmm. of like funnel the animals to a certain area. Uh, one of my graduate students, like she's not doing this uh, directly, but she's also trying to understand quantitatively, like uh, Ashley. So she's trying to study elk movement and she's gonna build some quantitatively model. Uh, and one of the goals is to try to help us understand you know, the, the movement of the elk and whether their locations that are more likely to have elk crossing the road, and then if so, like can we move them somewhere else? Yeah. So, so, so there is something going on right now. Uh, but for me, I'm more interested in a broader scale. So not not just not just like a like one species, right? Uh, but more species. So so uh, kind of like what I did for New Mexico, right? More species and cover a greater spatial extent. So those are the type of question we should. Uh, start thinking about. Uh, so not just like one location or one highway. Well, thanks so much. I, I think that we've run out of time, but we, <laughs> I think we've answered all the questions. I hope I didn't miss it. I didn't miss any, but it sounds like maybe you might've gotten a couple messages as well. Um, but yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a good comment before we end uh, this from Kimberly, like, like just for your information. Oh, today. So uh, assembly member Laura uh, Friedman introduced a bill today that would prioritize crossings and other infrastructure projects to improve wildlife connectivity and make California roads safer. Uh, the bill is AB 2344. Well, hopefully it will pass. If it passes, then that would be great. Well, we'll have to look more into that. Maybe we can share some more info about that on our social media as well once we can read more about it. That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, and thank you again for joining us tonight, Dr. Wan, and sharing all about habitat connectivity and how important this is for wildlife conservation to be successful. So good luck with all of your future projects. We really are looking forward to updates and want to hear more as you are getting settled into uh, Humboldt County. <laughs> um, and this is our final lecture, uh, or our, sorry, no, our final lecture in the series is next month. So that's going to be Wednesday, March 16th at 7 p.m. And one of our zoo's past conservation grant recipients uh, PhD and DVM Fernando Najira with the University of Madrid's Veterinary Medicine Department will be talking about the successful reintroduction of the endangered Iberian lynx 
And we can't wait to hear about the success of this project and how funding from our zoo helped make this reintroduction a success. So I am on the edge of my seat, can't wait for the next talk too, and we will see you all then. But thanks for joining us tonight.